But today, I want to ask you the question, you know, David shared with us communion, he, he brought communion, I'm very proud of how God is, and, and I don't say that in a, a, a selfing sense, because I'm proud of what the Lord's doing in him, amen? amen. And, and, and how God is growing him, because one day, you know, we may find David not among us, because he will be out there doing the work that God has for him to do. And Miss Amy says, no, 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 no. But I have to ask the question, what is communion? What does communion mean? I have asked the question. I'm looking for an answer. Okay. What is communion? What does communion mean? Brother David. To have fellowship with the Lord during that meal. Okay. Anybody else? And with each other. Okay, anyone else? Anything else? Remembrance. Remembrance. Awesome. Awesome, very good. Anything else? What is communion? What does communion mean? Important? Yeah, it's very important. Yeah, yeah. We call it a sacrament of the, of the church. And that makes it important. It means set apart. Okay? He forgave us. Yes, it is, it is. Yes, yes. Very good. Very good. Well, David Webster is with us, but there's another Webster that I like to refer to on many occasions, and it's the Webster Collegiate Dictionary. <laughs> and this is what Webster defines communion as. Communion, as you see it enunciated up there, is a noun. And it says an act or instance of sharing. Now I think that's an amazing thing because it's a noun, but it has an action with it, doesn't it? It's a noun with an action. That kind of makes it a verb. Hmm. Then it goes on. It says, as it is capitalized, okay, it is a Christian sacrament in which consecrated bread and wine are consumed as memorials of Christ's death or as symbols for the realization of a spiritual union between Christ and communicant, that would be us, those who partake of, or as the body and blood of Christ. The act of receiving communion. C, capitalized, is the part of a communion service in which the sacrament is received. Number three, it's an intimate fellowship or rapport, communication. Number four, a body of Christians having a common faith and discipline. I'm amazed at how communion plays into so many of the common words. Okay? C-O-M-M-U-N, right? Communion. C-O-M-M-U-N-I-O-N is part of C-O-M-M-O-N, part of C-O-M-M-U-N-I-C-A-T-I-O-N, and part of Christ. It's also part of community. C-O-M-M-U-N-I-T-Y. And that is one of the things that I want us to see here. When we are looking at this definition, when we are, are bringing this definition into our minds, it's, it's understanding that there is an act or an instance of sharing. There is a verb. There is action here. This noun has action. It forces us to go, to do something. And what is that doing something? It's recognizing a sacrament, okay? And it is becoming part in that sacrament and receiving the body and blood of Christ. But it is also an intimate fellowship or report with whom? God Himself. It's communication. See that as a capital C up there for communication? Because it's communication between us and Him. But then the next thing it is, the last line, that deals with us as a community. Because you see, thank you Brother Ryan, that, that's exactly what I wanted. When you see, when we think of the word communion, when we think of what communion is, we have got to think of it in the context of the whole definition. Because God leaves nothing out. God leaves nothing out. Now, I'm going to talk about communion today. 
And I'm going to talk about it from an aspect that I hope each and every one of you understands. I don't know everything, right? Yeah, you can shake your head and say, yes, Pastor, you don't know everything. Okay? I am not all-knowing. But we know the all-knowing one. And He has given us insight into His realities. And today I want to take us into part of that reality. I want to give you some of what He has shown me so that I can teach you to understand what communion truly is. Because today we shared in what was called worldwide communion. In other words, all the Christians throughout the world today are partaking of, uh, of communion. However, I will tell you this, because of that last line where it says that, you know, that, that we come in common faith and, and, and unity, there are many evangelical Christian, conservative Christian, fundamental Christian churches that purposely will not take communion today. Does anybody know why? Because they don't want to be part with people who don't believe the way they truly believe. So therefore, they eliminate themselves from that group. And I'm okay with that. Because we don't have to take communion on this day. We do it here in the heart of Christ church as a remembrance that there is going to be a day when all of us who truly are the body of Christ will take communion together. You see, I truly believe the Scriptures where it tells us that we are not supposed to worry about the tares that have grown up among us. That God can take care of them in their time. So I will take communion knowing that my real brothers and sisters are among this and in this and God will separate the tares. That's why we're told at the beginning of every one of our communions if there's anything wrong with your spirit don't partake. Because we want to make sure we partake in a right manner. So you see communion is all about having that communication, that community and it begins as a community with God. How do I know this? Well, I'm going to have you turn to a Scripture that you probably would not think of when it comes to the thought of communion. It's actually in the book of Hebrews. In the book of Hebrews. And it's chapter 10. So please turn to the book of Hebrews and chapter 10. Now, I'm going to do something here a little bit different today, and I've done this before. Uh, this is one of my, this is one of my, uh, uh, how do I want to call it? Normally, it would be a coloring book, uh, what I call my coloring book sermons, where I have it all colored out. But today, I figured, nah, we're not going to do that. I'm going to treat this just like a Bible study, where I would go over verses and then espouse upon them. So please bear with me because we're not reading the whole Scripture all at one time and then going back to it. We're going to read it in portions and then we're going to talk about it and what's happening. So what we're going to do first here is we need to understand that communion does equal community and it begins with the reality that God wants us to have communion and community with Him because it starts with Him. All right, Verse 1. In chapter 10, it's where we're beginning, and I'm going to read this through uh, uh, to 11, and then I'm going to stop, and then we're going to read again, and I'm going to stop, so all the way through to 11. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. 
In the scroll of my book it is written of me to do your will, O God. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will he have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Blessed be the word of our Lord. In these Scriptures we read how communion was not able to be accomplished because the sacrifices of bulls and goats and pigeons and whatever was being used was not enough. It would take away sin only momentarily. And therefore the communion with God would be broken. So it was constantly a renewal relationship, renewal relationship, renewal relationship. And every time a person sinned, now I need to ask you a question. Since we have taken bread and wine here this morning already, how many of you have had a bad thought in this room? Yeah, don't be ashamed to raise your hand. Mine's in the air. So we've already broken relationship with God if it were by the blood of bulls and lambs and goats and pigeons. We didn't even make it out of the room. And our communion was broke. God says, that's not the communion I want. You were created to have communion with Me fully, totally, holy, all the time. And He knows there's nothing we can do to bridge that gap. So what did He do? He sent His Son, Jesus Christ. We just read it. In heaven, He says, Behold, you prepare a body for Me, and I go to do Your will. What was His will? That Jesus Christ would become communion for us. That He would be the broken bread. That He would be the poured out blood. That it would be His life. Now why is the life and uh, the blood and, and body of Christ so much more than the blood and body of bulls. Well, here's the reality. The life is in the blood. Okay, We can only have life through the life-giving blood of another animal or another being, the sacrifice of that other being. It's the only way we can have life. Life has to be offered. There has to be death. Well, the bull dies and there's no more life in it. But in Christ Jesus, there is life. Because His life, yes, it's in the blood, but His life is also in His body. For when He died, He was resurrected. So He yet lives. So when they offered up a bull, it was dead. But when Christ was offered up, He died for a period of time to sanctify us, to take our sins into hell, and He rose again from the dead that those of us who believe in Him and partake of that body now have everlasting communion with God for our sacrifice liveth. And we have communion with God. How many of you have ever thought of what you do as all that? And folks, that's just what your pastor realizes. And I'm nowhere near perfection. Think what communion is going to mean when we realize just what it means in the Trinity. I want you to think about this for a second. The Trinity is total communion. Three in one. Ever existing. Never not existing. Forever. Always. Because you see, when God was in His own form, without any of us, without anything He created, 
Did he need any of this? Absolutely not. He was complete and full and total in and of himself. He did not need any more. But God said, it would be nice. It would be nice to be able to have a precious thing. Something that would choose to love me for no other purpose than to love me. Simply because I am. Wait a minute, that's his name. Hmm. Do you think there's a reason he called himself I am? Because you see, God didn't have to have us. But God wanted us. For what? For choosing communion. For choosing to be with Him. Not that He needed any more. He didn't. But the awesome part was, He thought more of His own thought than He thought of Himself. What do I mean by that? How many of you think about or thought about having your children before you had your children? I can tell you right now that my dear wife and I, before we got married, it was one of the things we talked about, we wanted to have children. I wanted six. She said, well, that's impossible. You can't have any. I said, well, theoretically, you're right. I want you to have six. And I think she said something about, I'll do the first one and you have to do the rest or something like that. <laughs> the amazing thing to me was and is, that's what I'm talking about. God conceived in His mind that He could do this thing. And He thought more of the thought that He could literally make a creation that could choose Him. Not one that had to love Him or had to have a relationship with Him. Because being God, He could do that. And He did. They're called angels. Okay? They're called the animals of our world. They are all created in an order that they know God. Because they have been given that order. But we were given free will. A will to choose communion. A will to choose something that was beyond ourselves to have us come to a place of community. That we could literally choose to be with God and God with us. A place where the Trinity becomes part of who we are and we become part of who the Trinity is. For God says, Jesus says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. If you obey my, my commands and love me and come unto me, I will come unto you and you will be in me and I will be in you. So that means we're also part of the Father and we're also part of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Because that's how the Holy Spirit comes to us. is through Christ. So all of a sudden, communion starts to have this compounding effect upon us and our relationship with God. Because God wants us to understand that it comes through His blood. Let's look back at the Scriptures again. Pick up your Bibles. We're going to read on from verse 12. We're going to read to 19. He says, But He, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until His enemies be made a footstool for His feet. For by one offering, He has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart, and on their mind I will write them. He then says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of those things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus... What? By a new 
and living way, which He inaugurated through us through the veil that is His flesh. Do you see it? Isn't it amazing? How many times have we read Hebrews in the 10th chapter and how many of us thought about communion? That's what this is talking about. This is talking about communion. This is talking about what Christ paid for us. You see, the cross is communion. It's the real communion. What we partake of in the bread and the cup is merely a symbol of what was. It's a remembrance. But in that remembrance, by faith, it draws us into this real relationship that through the blood of Christ and the broken body, which is alive, we now have a way. The only way. Jesus said that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So we have communion through the blood, through the body. Because, verses 21 and 22, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. All of a sudden, we have been made right. We have been made ready to come into the presence of God, to have communion with Him, to be a community with God, to have community with God, to communicate with God, to have something in common with God, a righteousness and a holiness that we did not have before, a gift given to us by the love of God, through the grace of God, by the power of God, for the glory of God. May I hear an amen in the house of the Lord. You and I, God poured out His all that we could have communion with Him. That we could be a community with Him. That we could communicate with Him. How great is the love of God for those who are in Christ Jesus. The reality is God wants every person in the world to know that. That's why we're here as the church. To share what we know with the world. You know, it amazes me because we send our kids to school to be taught, right? How many of you realize that years ago, who was the teacher? Mom and dad. Because generally, the kids grew up, mom taught them how to read and write, if mom knew how to read and write, and hopefully she did. And dad taught them how to work and till the ground and plant the crops and everything else. And, you know, mom taught the girls how to sew. And, 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 you know, it just went on and on and on. And we had a thriving society. Now we send them off to school and they come back and we don't even know who they are anymore. We don't know what they are anymore. Because that's where our world is teaching them. We've turned the authority over because we've, We've walked out of communion. We've walked out of communion. We don't understand how important communion is. But God says, I'm not done there. God says, yes, I want you to have communion with me. I want you to be my community. And I want you to have community with you. But God takes it further. If you remember the definition there, the last definition, which is, which is the definition that defines us, because the first three definitions is what we... Isn't it amazing? Because I think it's funny. The first three definitions that we saw, that's all what we just did. Okay? That's all about God and our relationship with Him. And then He tacks one more on there, and it's about the common good of all of us who share in one belief. Because you see, God does not just want us to have a com community with Him because that's what the world wants us to believe. 
Oh, your faith is private. You just keep it between you and God. Now, if you want to go to church and share it with all those other people that are there, that's fine. But don't take it out into the world, right? Isn't that what they're telling us? But that's not what God tells us. Let's see what God has to say from verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. Going to hold there for just a second. You and I need to understand, and, and I pray that we do, that here we're told we're supposed to stand fast. We are to believe what we know and stand fast. Right now, the world is telling us a lot of stuff. They're telling us that we're wrong. They're telling us that we're bigots. They're telling us that we're very closed-minded. Okay? Well, if the world wants to call me a bigot, go for it. I'm a bigot. Do you know why I'm a bigot? Because I believe that there is one way. Do you know why I believe I'm a bigot? Because Jesus told me that He is the only way to the Father, that the only way for forgiveness of sin is through the cross of Calvary, that the only way for redemption is through the communion of the saints, okay, through the sanctifying grace of God by the blood of Christ, sacrificed on the cross of Calvary, risen on the third day to the glory of God, that all men might believe. Am I a bigot? Yes! Because the Bible tells me to be one. There's only one way. That's the definition of a bigot. I'm a bigot. Get over yourselves. Let them call you a bigot. Say, yes, I am. Because I do not believe in pluralism. There is no such thing as pluralism in sanctification. Jesus did not say, choose whichever one you like. Get over yourselves. Let them call you names. Does it matter? Stand firm on what you know. They're going to call you racist. Well, you hate Muslims. Oh, I don't hate them. I love them. I just don't like them. There's a difference. Well, and you look at them and say, wait a minute, you hate me. You're showing me that right now. Well, I don't hate you. Well, then you don't like me very much, right? That's the exact same thing I just said to you. Use their own words against them. Please remember, God wants us to understand that we need to stand fast. We need to look at this, this reality that we're, God knows we're going to come under persecution. Why do you think He would write such a thing? Because He knows that when the testing comes that we simply need, as he says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Did God really say that? Well, you know, I'm not really in. I, I guess you could interpret that. Thus saith the Lord. Period. You know, there's one church out there that says God's still speaking and they have a big comma. Okay? And I think that's hilarious. Because God is still speaking, but He spoke every word. Period. The words just last for eternity. Amen? We need to remember, God's not changing His mind on what He has said. What he has said has stood and stands and yet speaks to us today. He says, stand fast. And he goes on. He says, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Wow. Brothers and sisters, church, let me tell you, when we come together in communion, when we come, what we just shared here today is something that brings us together. This table brings us together. It gives us that common sense, that commonality, that communion, that community, that we can communicate with each other and be an even larger and more powerful entity in our society to bring forth change, to help people in their times of need and in their struggle. So many times in the church, 
one of the things, that, and, and I see this, because, man, I can remember before I became a Christian, I said, I'm not going to that place. That, there are a bunch of hypocrites in there. I hear them at the bar, and they're all talking about each other, and they're <laughs> biting and growling. That's what I was doing, right? Biting and growling. But that's what the Christians were doing. It wasn't until I realized, oh, okay, that's what a Christian is. We're fallen people saved by grace. Amen? But one of the things that we need to do is stop growling at each other, don't we? Stop biting at each other. You know, it, 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 it amazes me. You know, we, we need to understand that we need to be here to help one another. When we see a brother or sister who's down, you know, do we kick them? I'll teach that sucker. No, when we see a brother or sister who's down, we need to pick them up. No, we need to get down there with them. You know, I think it's one of the most amazing things because as Christians, we want to fix everybody. We want to fix everybody. Oh, I'm going to get in there and I'm going to fix this thing. I'm going to make you right. Would you stop and just have communion with this person? Just have some community with this person? Which means what? Getting into their position. You know, sometimes people that are hurting just need to know that there's somebody there they can hurt with. I can remember my, 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 one of my best friends. He's one of my three guys, okay? This, this gentleman's one of my three. His name is Mike Pierce. Hi, Mike. God bless you. Mike Pierce. Uh, he and I have been on a walk for years. He's one of my three, and that means he's one of my, one of my intimate relationship guys. And, and I can remember one day we were sitting in the machine shop, okay? We were eating lunch, and I was in the fix-it mode. I'm going to fix Mike, okay? <laughs> and he starts telling me some stuff that was going on in his life, and boy, before he even got halfway through, I was starting to fix him. I'm going to tell him what he needs to do. And finally, Mike just stopped, and he left me go on my tear, and he looks at me and he says, Rich, would you please just shut up and listen? I don't need you to fix me, dude. God's doing that. I just need you to walk the road with me. I think Mike just fixed me. Sometimes that's what we need to remember, guys and gals. We just need to be found on the road with these people. With each other. To have community and communicate. Okay? And lift each other up. Help each other. Encourage each other. Love each other. Now that does mean, not mean you love their sin. Okay? If that person that's down there is down there because of a sin, we need to be careful. The, sin, the Scripture says that we need to be careful lest we be tempted also. Amen? We need to be careful. But we need to get down there. We need to get dirty. Remembering that we have already been washed. We've been washed in the blood. In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb. Because we have been clean. And we're no longer dirty. We don't need to worry about being dirty again. Because the blood of Christ cleanses us. And that's eternal. Verse 24. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Oh, Wow! Here's a sense of communion. Here's a sense of community that, oh, I just love. You know, I, I think this is one of the places where, where each and every one of us can shine. Because we need to think about, you know, how in the world, how are we going to, how do we stimulate more? Uh, in the NIV, it says to stir one another. Okay? Oh, to encourage one another. How do we do this? Well, when we see a brother or sister who's in a ministry, you know, Miss Dottie's been asking for folks to give her themes for the parade. 
Okay? Man, we ought to be praying about that and we ought to be pumping her full of ideas. Oh, man, have you thought about doing this? Have you thought about doing that? da 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 da, -da, -da. But instead, we'll sit back and say, hmm, I wonder if it's just going to be the same old thing. How many people are going to help this time? Now, dare I say that's where any of us have ever gone. We would never think things like that or do things like that, right? In any ministry, on any form. I'm just picking on one. Because I know for a fact that within this congregation, we have had people who have thought to themselves, well, I would like to have had that position, so now I'm just going to hate that thing because I didn't get that position. Well, you know what? The first shall be last and the last shall be first. So if you think about this person who has been given that responsibility, guess what? Now all of it lays on their shoulders. So if they become the first, because they're the one who's standing up front, right? If they become the first, don't you think that you who come alongside and raise them up, that God's going to look at that and say, wow, you know, rather than being in self and, and in, 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 in your egress of self, you are lifting this person up. Wow, because now all of a sudden the first becomes last and the last becomes first. Because where do we store up our rewards? In earth or in heaven? We need to remember that part of communion is storing up treasure in heaven. Because it's about community. It's about being Christ to those who are in this with us. You know, I've had several of you who have said to me, why do people always come to me with all their problems? Duh! Because they come to me the same way. Why? Because you're supposed to be the super spiritual... Brother Chuck. Where's Brother Chuck? Oh, they, okay. They, they took off. Well, then I can talk about him all I want. Brother Chuck called me at one time here a while ago. It was a long time ago. We were, he was not anywhere near where he is now. And he says to me, he says, Pastor, I need you to pray for me because you got a direct line to God. <laughs> I'm looking around my house for the red phone. You know what I mean? Where is that sucker? I need to talk now. But it so amazes me because that's what we need to remember. When, when people are coming to us and they're sharing with us, they, it's because they look at us as something more. And they want us to come alongside of them and raise them up. They don't want us to, to be burdened by, their, by what they're telling us. They want us to, to, to help them because they believe that we have this more, better relationship with God. And guess what? If they believe it, why don't you? It amazes me. As a pastor, I love it when people come to me and they say, because then I get to take them right to the same place I have to go, which is the foot of the cross. And God welcomes everyone there. He's never rejected a soul. And He's waiting at the foot of the cross. And that's the only place any of us has to go. And that's what we have to do. Is we've got to become broken with them and take them to the foot of the cross. Even if they don't want to go there because they don't want to realize they're the ones broken. We need to encourage one another. We need to spur one another on to even greater things. Jesus says, greater things than I have done will you do. And we need to be pressing that in our lives. Do you know there's a reason why your pastor will never become more than he already is? That's because I need all of you to surpass me. My goal is not that I become more, but that you become more. That you become the ministers that this world needs. I'm ministering to you that you may go out and minister to others, that you may see the influx. You are the church. I'm simply the pastor who's, taught to, who's been told to lead the church, to teach the church, to empower the church. You are the church. You will do far greater things than I will ever do. 
You look at me and you say, oh, well, he's a spiritual giant. Excuse me, this is grape juice and bread. There is no mystery in it. <laughs> Brother David just did it for the first time. Did you see the Shekinah glory of God? Did you see the mirrors and the smoke? No, I saw a man whose heart was given to the Lord speaking to us about a physical reality in a spiritual manner. Leading people to a throne of grace. Building us up. I got to land this plane or I'm going to get in trouble. Last verse. Verse 25. Not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We are in that day. It is drawing near. And it is calling loudly against the church. And we need to encourage one another to not give up. We need to encourage one another when we see the attacks coming. We need to literally be there to help the brother, help the sister, get involved. We need to be the church of Jesus Christ because we have a sense of community because of the communion that we share together in the bond of the blood of Christ and His broken body given for each and every one of us. Because you see, it is that sense that God wants us to understand that we are in form of physical representation of the Trinity. That we all belong one to another. Each of us is in one another through a spiritual bond, but also a physical bond in the church. You and I need to remember and we need to continue to walk as only God can allow us to walk through the grace that He has given us to be the church of Jesus Christ. His love outpoured into a world that so desperately needs it. Remember, He sent Christ and we received Christ. This world needs Christ, but they'll not see Him. They'll see us because we're alive, we're flesh and blood, and they have to deal with us. But let's give them something to deal with, amen? That means some of us are going to go to jail. I honestly believe that. Some of us are going to go to jail. Guess what? It happened in the first centuries. It'll happen in the last centuries. Are you willing? Because I'm going to need company when I'm in there. God is not done. His sense of community is unto the very purging of the gates of hell itself. In fact, in the book of Jude, it says that we are to snatch them from the flames as they are perishing. We need to realize those flames are burning pretty bright right now. God is not done yet. And He wants to have that sense of communion and community. And this is where it all comes into play. What did we just do today? We took communion, that we are one with God. But in that communion, we are one with each other. And we have a plan and a purpose. And that plan and purpose comes from God, who has given it to us through His Son, Jesus Christ, in this example. His living example. So today I pray that each and every one of us here would understand that God wants us to have a communion with Him, but He also wants us to have communion and community with Him each other would you pray with me this day father god we truly need to praise you we need to lift your name for you lord jesus have brought us to a place where we truly understand that you are you are life itself and you have a purpose for us in that life and that purpose, Lord, is to share Your love with others that Your original purpose may be fulfilled. That people would choose to love You simply because You are. 
Father God, as we bring forth our praise here in the end of our service, I pray that you would move in each life here to go out into this world and to bring back brothers and sisters to increase our communion and to increase your communion. For Lord God, that is what you sent the church forward to do. And may we be found faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.